Hi, Gary Stearman of Prophecy Watchers. I've got a very special guest with me today. His name is Tim Mahoney. He is a filmmaker, film producer, director of the first quality, and he's put out some wonderful films, the latest of which we're going to discuss in a few moments. But right now, here's Tim. Well, thanks for having me on the show again, Gary. I really appreciate it. We appreciate having you, and uh, you and I have talked and I have uh, confessed to you the, the fact that, that your films have an emotional effect on me. And, you know, when you pay your uh, $6 or whatever it is for a ticket and you go into the movies and sit down, traditionally you want to be moved by something. You've, you've paid your money. You really want to be emotionally involved in this thing. And a lot of movies fall far short of that. Yours, however, I have to say, have a history of just moving me, and at one point almost to tears as you disclosed a discovery about Moses. Uh, you've done patterns of evidence, the Moses controversy, the Red Sea miracle, part one, and we're going to be talking about part two. But in the Moses controversy, uh, the uh, the emotional uh, truth that comes through that film is just memorable. You know, that film was a film that I had no plans of making. It was a complete surprise to me, uh, actually working on that. Uh, but I could tell that in our, in, a, in fact, our very first film, as you might remember, was called uh, Patterns of Evidence, The Exodus. And that film was a film that I ended up actually, after the, right in the very beginning, had a crisis of faith. I thought I was going to go find evidence for the Bible, and I came back with doubts. And, the, and the, the emotional journey for me was, was, was being able to uh, find answers to big questions that I had about the Bible. And that's the journey that is in that first film. Then the second film was also part of answering some big questions because I was told that there was no evidence that Moses... Uh, you know, existed that that uh, they were there was a lot of criticism. It's called higher criticism that Moses even wrote the first books of the Bible, and so this particular focus of an, the investigation, the Moses controversy, the controversy was: Did Moses write the first books of the Bible or not? And why is it so controversial? Is because the rest of the Bible points back to Moses's authorship, and not only that, but Jesus basically claims and states that Moses wrote about him. So, he, so yeah. you can say, yeah, if people say that Moses didn't exist, then what does that say about Jesus? Absolutely. Uh, Jesus matter-of-factly mentioned to an audience, uh, and he said, when Moses wrote about me, he said, and then he quoted of what Moses had written. Well, that's good enough for me, uh, coming out of the lips of Jesus. So the Moses controversy was... Uh, significant in my own life because it was about the alphabet and what we could see in that first film that second film there was that that the alphabet was necessary to be able to communicate some you know the ideas of the bible you know there was other writing forms but it wasn't just about the ability to write something you could have written i guess in other forms but the alphabet was now something that was so simple to learn to understand that common people could actually learn it because of the phonetic style of, of writing. And why that was significant is because Moses actually told people to write these commands on your doorposts and teach them to your children. And so this is the question of literacy and the fact that uh, at the end of the film, I start to realize that what if the alphabet was more than just a coincidence something that was just invented, hapstance or something, uh, because uh, it was so powerful that this basic alphabet that actually begins at the location where we show that the Israelites lived and grows and spreads throughout the world is the foundation of all alphabets. And I, saw, I thought, well, what if the alphabet is, is, is really, its real intention is to retain the knowledge of God? And that is the the big idea in the Moses controversy. Yeah, and when you think about, uh, you know, the English alphabet, as we call it, you know, it goes right back to the Aleph Bet in Hebrew. I mean, uh, it, it doesn't take a big uh, <laughs> intellect to understand, that, you know, that what started so many thousands of years ago comes down to us 
chiefly through the Bible, and which is the marvelous part of it. And uh, I have to say that when Tim uh, puts this on film, uh, he does it in such a way that he builds like a suspense, and and he keeps you going, and you, you can't uh, you can't sit there detached and say, well, what time is it? You actually uh, want to see what's coming next. And, and that's an art, Tim, and you've got it. Oh, thank you. You know, uh, I made lots of commercials. I made hundreds and hundreds of commercials. In fact, I just, we're, we're, we're planning on moving our offices and I had to rent, a, I had to rent a dumpster and filled it full of tapes. It was thousands of pounds. Of, so but when you make a commercial, what you realize is that you have to, within 30 seconds, you have to basically catch people within the first few seconds, and then you right. unfold it. There's there's like a three-act play in a commercial. And so you've got you know that those 24, 25, 26 seconds before you do a tag on the end of it. But that that discipline of, of marketing and and trying to communicate the essence of an idea quickly uh, has been very helpful for me as a documentary filmmaker because I realize that the same challenges are there is that, well, what is it and how can we make it engaging uh, so that people don't, you know, fall asleep while, while they're watching your movie? Now, moving along, let's go to the third film, The Red Sea Miracle. And uh, years ago, uh, uh, I interviewed Dr. Leonard Muller, and, and he uh, has written just a marvelous book uh, about Moses uh, and the Red Sea crossing, among many other things. And he mentioned at that time uh, that it might be possible that there were traces that the Egyptian army had left behind when they were sunk in, in the waters of the Great Sea, as described in the Bible. Well, that got me started, and this is quite a few years ago. Now, you uh, were well acquainted with Dr. Uh, Muller. Yes, uh, I actually did go in 2002. He had been there before, I, but he invited me to go with the film crew, and that's when we went in uh, to the area of the Delta. We went all over Egypt, and we went to the uh, Nueva Beach area, uh, and you know, on the dive boat and everything, and and that began my uh, first experiences as a, as an investigative filmmaker with Dr. Moeller. And that film now is really, uh, that beginning of that film in 2002, we've now, within this week, completed that 18-year journey with footage from those past 18 years all the way up till recent, and then even footage earlier than that. So this Red Sea Miracle investigation is probably going to be one of the biggest I could, I could say it's probably the biggest investigation ever conducted into the possible different crossing locations uh, where the, the, the miraculous parting of the sea took place. Uh, and as you know, I've, I've even included some of the Cecil B. DeMille family. Uh, yes. Uh, they speak to this. And uh, we've done re recreations, you know, with actors and with animations. And uh, we, we look at, I believe it's seven different crossing locations in the two Red Sea Miracle films. You know, uh, a lot of people have, have said that the, the greatest thing ever to come out of Hollywood was the Ten Commandments, Cecil B. DeMille, and he did some of the narration himself. Uh, you interviewed his daughter uh, in uh, your film, your latest film, and uh, I found all of this just amazing because uh, I can, I'll never forget my first reaction, even as a, uh, a very, very young kid, to the Ten Commandments. It was just amazing. Same fact for me. I, I mean, it was a big event, you know. In fact, I actually have a recreation scene, uh, you know, in this film about me as a child watching the Ten Commandments. And uh, by the way, it's his granddaughter. Cece is the one who I met. Uh, and she, uh, uh, her grandfather loved the Bible. And that's why he made the different films that he did about the Bible. Uh, and he did set... Uh, a context for a lot of us uh, to to understand he really kept the Bible alive for the last 50 years because because every year it was on nationwide you know the, uh, yes. the Ten Commandments uh, would you like to see a trailer of this Red Sea Miracle Part 2? Yes absolutely. absolutely. Well, let, let's show it now. Okay. For a long time the idea was that the Israelites crossed down through here and crossed the Suez. 
And you don't think there was a crossing at the Suez or at Aqaba? As far as I'm concerned, they're just too deep, too difficult. If God exists, then miracles are entirely possible because there is a God there to act. The wind can't do it. You have to rely then on a spectacular miracle. It's explicit. The Bible says, and the Lord sent a strong east wind which blew all night. If you had told me that somewhere near the Sinai, wind blows and splits the water, I could find it from there. And had you ever seen a chariot wheel before? My eye caught something. It was uh, circular in nature. Two wheels stand like this right. with an axle in between. Right. Circular shape, circular shape. For certain, it's not a coral reef. And if you've got evidence, maybe it should be uh, certified in some way. This was the only time that I had seen anything definitive, period. How can we make a judgment on something we've never seen? What you're saying is not wrong to look. We need to look, but we also need to verify. Do you think it was a larger miracle, or do you think it was a smaller miracle? The text indicates it was very large. A miracle is something that God does for us. He wants to get our attention. And people actually who in our academic environment are sticking our necks out <laughs> to talk about this. The text is clear. Yahweh was at work in pushing back the water. This isn't about wind getting glory. This is about God getting glory. You can call it the Sea of Reeds. You can call this the Red Sea. You can call it the Blue Sea. I don't care. This is Yam Suf. Wow. I hope that caught your interest. That's just a, a little taste uh, of what you're going to see. And again, as a filmmaker, Tim Mahoney is, uh, you know, right up there with the best of them. And uh, let me just say that part one of the Red Sea uh, miracle uh, has a lot of very interesting debate about what's really written in Scripture. What does it say? And, and what areas is it talking about? Now, when you get into the Red Sea Miracle 2, you take that to the next level, Tim. Describe what you're doing. Yes. Well, the question then uh, looks at the crossing sites. We know that in, in our films, we try to make uh, it easy for people to understand concepts. And one of the concepts was an Egyptian point of view, which is near Egypt, where the crossing happened, more naturalistic, and a Hebrew viewpoint, which is farther from Egypt, a larger desert that they crossed, and a much larger sea that was a body of water that was crossed. So the question of these films, this, this particular investigation, has to do with, was this a big miracle, or was this what I would call a smaller miracle. Uh, uh, both, mir yeah. I mean, it's a miracle. People would say on either side that it's a miracle because the miracle on a, on a shallow lake would be more or less the timing of how it happened so that God worked within nature to part the sea. Now, uh, at the Gulf of Aqaba, the other, that particular viewpoint would be that, well, it's possible that God miraculously and spectacularly parted the water. And that the, that the walls of water on both sides, like Cecil B. DeMille has shown, uh, that, that that would be more in keeping with a, a miraculous, spectacular uh, God who, who would be uh, parting this water so that people would know about it. And what the Bible says is that, that for, uh, for all the nations, they, they trembled. Uh, when they heard they about heard this, because they knew about this this miracle, and they knew what happened to the Egyptian army. Well, it was it's called a mighty sea. It's called the deep. Uh, it's it's crashing waves. It's huge, uh, and yet if you uh, take the the traditional Gulf of Aqaba uh, route, you're not talking about deep water at all. And if you're going down the uh, the west side of the Sinai Peninsula, down to the south. Uh, essentially, uh, it, it's it's doable, I guess you could say, but not miraculous. It does it, in no way, in my mind, uh, is described by what the Bible is looking at, which is deep waters, great waves, 
And when the waves come crashing back, and I'm talking about what the Bible is saying here, not what Cecil B. DeMille filmed, but when those waves come crashing back, uh, the Egyptian army sinks. And the Bible describes all that, Tim. And the thing that I, I want to get across is that uh, your Red Sea Miracle Part 2 documents that very, very uh, carefully. Yes, and, and this Friday uh, we have a special, I know a lot of your watchers are our thinkers. We're trying to get out to our thinkers. We've got a, uh, you can become a thinker by just signing up, but we've got a special uh, showing on February, I'm sorry, I got my last film in, uh, on uh, <laughs> July 17th. On July okay. 17th, Friday at 7 p.m. Central Time, we've got a showing of this film. Uh, with a, a live panel discussion. We've never done anything like this. And you know how live is. So people are really oh, yeah. scared scared of live and all that. But we're, we're, we've got the film. We're going to be playing the film, starting it. There's a pre-show, actually, about a 20-minute pre-show. on. And again, it's this coming Friday, uh, July 17th at 7 p.m. Central. And it's worldwide. You can watch it anywhere. Uh, but you can get tickets for that. You can have your family over and uh, and watch it. As a fa- you know, as a family experience or friends, if you trust everything, just uh, watch it at home, right? Yeah, watch it at home, and uh, and then we're going to have a panel discussion uh, at, at the end of the film. But this is a big film; it has an intermission, so it'll have a ninety. It'll, it'll go for ninety minutes, and then we've got an intermission, uh, and then we'll come back uh, and watch the end of the film. And as you know, this film has some su- some surprises in it. Uh, I do and, know that. And, yeah. Uh, I've, I've had a little preview, thanks to you, and uh, surprises are, are very good surprises. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, would, I mean, here, let's just show another clip, uh, because we talked a little bit about the search for, for you know, re- the remains of Pharaoh's army. Here's a clip that, that goes, that's part of the film, uh, with Dr. Leonard Moeller. Of course, when Pharaoh and his host came out behind them, they were quite ready to stone Moses. It was here that Wyatt started to dive, looking for the remains of Pharaoh's chariots on the seafloor. Over time, others who learned about his search joined in the effort, including Swedish DNA research scientist, Dr. Leonard Moeller. I saw Moeller in a film about this subject and that's how I became aware of the Exodus investigation. I was impressed with his scientific approach. In experimental sciences, we have a very standardized procedure to follow. You put up a hypothesis, you perform an experiment, you or others can repeat the experiment, you do statistics, you put it all together, you have a manuscript and you publish it. That's the normal function for science. But if you go back in history, it's a totally different issue because we cannot repeat the experiment. But you can use scientific tools to investigate different parts of the history, and in that way you can apply science. You have air? Yeah. yeah I don't have to open it. No, that's Moeller and others continued the investigation that Ron Wyatt began. Since Wyatt first proposed New Wave of Beach, it has become the most popular option for a deep sea crossing in the Hebrew approach. And I must say, and going to Dr. Muller just to kind of takes me back. Uh, what a brilliant man. And uh, the, the ability to, uh, of uh, you and he to work together is just, it just brought out a marvelous uh, production. Well, I've been able to meet an awful lot of really good people over the, over the years of working on this. And, you know, the way this film is, is, has shaped up, I was expecting to make a film about, you know, which way did they go? And I think we did. Which way yeah. did the Israelites go? I'm, I'm going to give you the different options. But there's more than that, because in every case, uh, when you look at the biblical account, this is a film about miracles. And then I raised the question, well, do miracles still happen today? Uh, right. Is it possible for miracles to happen today? And I realized that in my own life that I had gotten to a place where I... Uh, would probably not ask for a miracle. 
and, and you know, not really, I mean, you, you just sort of accept, accept the world the way it is or accept circumstances the way they are. And I think that uh, towards the end of this film, I started to raise those questions. Well, do they still happen? What about when people ask for miracles and they don't happen? So the miracle question, even when I talked with uh, some of those people who are very supportive of our films, they were very cautious about me talking about this. <laughs> Because yes. they said, "Hey, you know, this is a this is a you know a dangerous subject to talk about miracles today," uh, but I think that uh, what we were able to do, because I've had um, a number of key people look at the film, and it's surprising that the support that we've gotten now uh, across a large spectrum that said, "You know what? This is a very, very significant and balanced film to give you an awful lot to think about." That's why we call our film company Thinking Man Films, right? <laughs> and and by the way, it, you do uh, stimulate a lot of thought, uh, and, and your films are very challenging. Again, uh, you have the Gulf of Aqaba approach, and you have the uh, uh, approach that's, that says that the uh, uh, Hebrew, uh, or the children of Israel coming out of Egypt, went to the shore of the Red Sea, which is a real sea. And when you uh, stop and actually think about what had to happen, uh, it's no wonder there's controversy about this because the real question behind all of this is, does God perform miracles? And you have to decide that in your own life. And I, I have to tell you, Tim, <laughs> I've decided that God does perform miracles. Well, and what happens is right now we're living in a time, uh, as I was working on this film, you know, we're right at the epicenter where a lot of this uh, unrest happened and the protests. Uh, we're in Minneapolis here. And the question is, is that we're, we reach a place in, in, our, in our history where we, where everyone comes to a point where they are like the Israelites. They're trapped between the sea yeah. and the Egyptian army. And there's nowhere to go. And they're praying for, you know, they need to, you, know, you get to a place where I call it the Red Sea moment, where you're, you're basically saying, okay, God, what are we going to do? Are, are we going to die here? And, you know, whether it's the death of your business, the death of, you know, even people with COVID, with their family members being sick, uh, the death of, of your, your plans for your life, you know, college students who today don't know if they're going to be able to go back to school. People don't know if they're going to get jobs. There's a lot of uncertainty. And so the question then is, is, well, what do we do with that uncertainty? Just like the Israelites. And we looked at that, uh, uh, you know, historically. And, and then how do we look at it today? And I think, so at the end of the film, I wanted to somewhat make it practical. And, and I think that that's the reason why um, I did want to explore the question of, do miracles still happen today? And do we have the faith to even you know, ask for them. Have, have your films, films been, been introduced, introduced at university, university level? level? And if so, what's been the feedback you've gotten? Well, uh, I do know because we, we ship out the, the, the films that some of them have been sent off to universities and libraries. Uh, I don't always know the feedback exactly uh, within the universities, uh, but I do know that some professors are telling me that they're showing the films to all their classes. Um, and I do know one story of a young woman who was uh, who who actually became a, a believer. She became a Christian, Christian and she went to she moved here from another country and she went to a college that she believed with Christian college. And the professor was she she was going to a Bible class um, and they were talking about the Exodus. And the professor basically said, well, there's no evidence. We don't even think this this really happened. And she was so yeah. distraught. She was like, well, why did I become a Christian if these uh, events in the Bible didn't happen? And she was on her dorm floor, and she was like, I don't know what she was considering, but she was considering not becoming a Christian anymore because she thought if it's not true, then why should I believe it? And that friend said, you should see patterns of evidence. And she says, what's that? And, you know, she looked it up, and at that time uh, she, she got a copy online and watched it, and she spent the whole night and taking notes. And the next day she, she went to her, back to her class and she told her professor, you are wrong. She says, there is evidence for the, for the exodus. And he says, wow. what are you talking about? And she says, you need to see patterns of evidence. And he said, what's that? 
And, uh, and so he ended up watching it. And apparently she said that she said, I wouldn't, she came to me at a conference. She said, I wouldn't be standing here, you know, if it wasn't for your film, because, because my, she says it changed my life. And my professor changed his class and he, wow. and he changed his, uh, his tune basically. He, and he started, he changed his test. So that's the one example that I can tell you that I know that, uh, in one setting that uh, it it brought a completely different viewpoint, and it's it probably saved that person's faith. You know, uh, after watching your films, I've looked. I, I make it a habit every time I see a new Bible, I open to the maps section in the back of the Bible to see how they feature the Exodus. And I have to tell you, sadly, that virtually every Bible shows the, uh, the, the route past the Gulf of Aqaba down to the uh, tip of the Sinai Peninsula. And, uh, of course, I think, uh, as far as I'm concerned, you've absolutely proven uh, that the other way, uh, the uh, Hebrew approach rather than the Egyptian approach, as you call them, uh, is the one that uh, stands up uh, to the test of academe. Well, I, what I've tried to do is, you know, as I've been mulling over over the years how to make a film, uh, what we've decided was to show as many viewpoints as we can and let the audience decide. And uh, originally I started out favoring what would be called the Hebrew approach, and I really haven't faltered from that uh, because of I just think that there's more biblical uh, evidence for that. Now, where the problem comes in is that if you think that the Israelites cross the Gulf of Aqaba, which is a sea, then you have a real miraculous uh, event. <laughs> because, uh, you know, I, I talked with one scholar years ago and he said, not even God could part water that deep. Well, it's kind of <laughs> humorous because if God created yeah. the heavens and the earth, it's not going to be wow. a problem for him to part water, uh, no matter what its depth. So, How true. so I, I, favor the, I favor that. But what we, once again, we tried to do in these films is to give you some opportunity to think about what are the different variables. Uh, well, you know, I, and, I thought, if I may interrupt a minute, I thought years ago, uh, I came to a point, I should say, where I decided that uh, it, for my faith to be complete, I have to uh, know, understand, and believe the miracles of the Bible. And, and when you can do that with assurance your faith has taken another step up, and I think you've followed that same pathway. I think right now, uh, well, thank you, and I, I do think right now we're we're living in a situation where, um, you know, people are facing trouble and challenges yes. that are going to take more than just a human solution. And that's, the, the, that's where I come to in this film as we're starting to investigate, you know, what are the possibilities of, of, of finding a way out of the trouble that we're in. And I think that it's having the faith that a miracle, that what's, what's necessary is a miracle. We don't, might not know what that miracle looks like uh, or what it could be, what, what it might become, but there's definitely some challenges that don't seem solvable without God intervening. The Red Sea Miracle 2, produced by uh, Tim Mahoney. And one more time, uh, tell people where they can see it and when. Well, if they go to our website, patternsofevidence.com, uh, you can sign up as a thinker and you can see the film. I know you have lots of thinkers uh, that are already oh, yeah. part, part of thinker. You're a thinker. Uh, uh, you can go to patternsofevidence.com and it's going to be Friday night, 7 p.m. Central Time. Uh, we've got a pre-show and it's going to have a panel discussion at the end of the film. It's going to be quite an evening. And so get your tickets now and tell your friends. And, and uh, uh, I, I'm excited for this film. This is the one that took 18 years to produce. Thanks a lot, Tim. We really appreciate, appreciate you being with us today. I'm Gary Stearman, by the way, and take advantage of that offer. You'll love Tim's films. Talk to you later, Tim. Thank you.